Lord, what a privilege it is to be in the house of God with these people of God. Lord, take the few moments that we have uh, this evening together and speak to our hearts. Grow us, strengthen us, teach us. Uh, Lord, we want to build our lives upon the foundation of your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Bearing false witness, thou shalt not bear false witness. The Ten Commandments convey to us, uh, the first four commandments convey to us how to love God. And uh, we look at those four commandments, it teaches us how to properly relate to God. Commandments 5 through 10, the last six commandments, tell us how to relate uh, with others. So the first four, how to relate to God, how to love God. The last six, how to love others. God placed uh, within the uh, Ark of the Covenant, inside the Ark of the Covenant, He placed uh, the rod, uh, Aaron's rod that budded. Uh, He placed the um, uh, manna, a bowl of manna. And then he also placed the Ten Commandments in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, This was symbolic of the very basic foundational ingredients that were necessary for a structured society if it was to be able to to flourish and to prosper and uh, to be able to be blessed of God. And so God placed these, in particular the Ten Commandments, in this place because they provide a portrait of a life that is pleasing to God, the Ten Commandments. As we look at these commandments, we see that the sixth commandment protects a person's life. The seventh commandment protects a person's marriage. The eighth uh, commandment protects a person's property. The ninth commandment calls us to protect one another's reputation by preserving the truth about that someone. And so all four of those are about protection. And it's so easy to tear down. And it's so easy to, um, uh, to, to shred one another and to look at each other. And it's easy to find the faults and imperfections in all of our lives. It's so easy. And so God says a part of this civilization structure that you're going to build upon, I want you to make sure that you're protecting uh, a person's life, their marriage, their property, and another's reputation. The ninth commandments recorded in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16 It's detailed in Exodus chapter 23. Uh, We'll look at that probably next week. We won't have time tonight to look at that. Uh, But it gives us the details. There's just a few words here uh, in verse number 16. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Uh, And then there's much of the chapter in chapter 23 of Exodus that outlines for specifically detailing what it means to bear or how not to bear false witness against our neighbor. And so the commandment, along with others, makes up the glue that holds the society together. When they took out the Ten Commandments out of our schools, and they took them out of the government buildings, uh, the very structure and foundation of our nation began to unravel. And uh, then it was prayer, and then it was God gets kicked out, and then just one thing, and then all this other garbage and filth uh, comes into our uh, schools and teaches our young people things that are certainly anti-God and anti-Bible and uh, certainly anti-authority uh, in regards to what uh, they're exposed to now today in school. But the Ten Commandments is that, that uh, the, the fabric of a, of a godly society that will be blessed of God. And a godly not being perfect or sinless, but a society that has been blessed of God. America, uh, by nature, over these many, many years, has been a nation that's been founded upon these laws of God. And even in our Constitution, the Bill of Rights and our founding fathers, they built much of the, the, the structure and the fabric of our uh, documents are based upon God's Word, obviously, but in particular, the Ten Commandments uh, that are outlined here in Exodus chapter number 20. To bear false witness means to tell something which is not true. To bear false witness means to tell something uh, that's not true. The Bible emphatically forbids all lying. And uh, we understand that the Ninth Commandment specifically is talking about a courtroom setting uh, within a jury and uh, standing before a judge and uh, outlining that in regards to bearing false witness uh, concerning someone that might be on the, on the witness saying whatever else. Uh, but it's not just uh, in regards to a jury situation. Uh, it's lying about uh, any situation, in particular about other people. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now we ask the question, who is our neighbor? 
Who's our neighbor? Is that the guy that lives next door? Is that uh, the guy that uh, we go to church with? Who is our neighbor? Someone asked that question of Jesus uh, in the New Testament in Luke chapter 10. In verse 29, a lawyer uh, asked that question. And Jesus, in response, uh, he gave the story of the Good Samaritan. And uh, you know the story. We won't take the time to review that story. But that's how he answered. Who is our neighbor? And uh, began to explain in the story of the Good Samaritan. In Jesus' story, it made it clear that uh, anyone that we encounter that needs our help is our neighbor. Uh, anyone that we cross paths with that we can be a help and a blessing to, then that is our neighbor. And guess what? All of us have some needs. And uh, all of us are in need of something. And that means that all of us are responsible for the rest of us concerning the neighbor uh, that we are one to another. And so God expects us to not bear false witness against thy neighbor. The ninth commandment instructs us about the importance of truth. The importance of truth. Truth is vital. It's vital uh, in regards to a marriage relationship. Uh, your marriage, our marriages are as strong as a foundation of truth within that marriage relationship. Uh, when, you give, um, uh, when, when, when you give your vows to one another in marriage, uh, you're giving to each other something very fragile, something very um, uh, 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 precious and valuable. You're giving each other each other's trust. And uh, that trust that you're giving to each other is, it has to be held very carefully and uh, very cautiously uh, because it is so easy to break that trust. Now, because of the culture that we live in, uh, we don't think very much of, uh, of issues. Our definition of truth and trust is so different than what the Bible says. Uh, we think, well, if I, I tell the truth most of the time, and, uh, you know, I do it, I, I sort of, uh, you know, I don't tell all the truth, but I don't say not what's the truth. And so there's a lot of ways that we try to get around and justify uh, not being truthful, uh, as God says that we ought to be. And so everybody needs to understand the importance that all of us uh, need to be truthful in all that we do. And that's what the Bible talks about in the Ninth Commandment. It challenges us, it commands us, it instructs us, you've got to be honest. You've got to be truthful. And uh, you've got to be forthright. And there's nothing worse that God despises. The Bible says it's an abomination unto God, abomination to God uh, when we don't speak the truth, when we lie and uh, we don't speak what is right and uh, proper. And so this means two things then uh, when it instructs us the importance of truth. It means don't lie in testifying in court, but it also means just don't lie, period. Uh, you'll stand in a courtroom and uh, you'll place your, your hand in the Bible and uh, raise your hand and do you swallow swallow to tell the truth, the whole truth, but it shall help you, God. And um, I don't know if they still do that, but for years they've done that. And uh, you put your hand in the Bible as the authority of truth, the absolute authority of truth. And then you would, you would pledge or vow that whatever you were going to say would be truthful and uh, would be honest and forthright. And so, yes, in a courtroom we ought to tell the truth because if we don't, it's what? Perjury. Uh, if we say something that's not true, uh, and uh, there can be some um, uh, infractions or things that we can get uh, uh, as a result of those lies in our testimony. But we also should be just as concerned about being truthful in all areas of our life. Because remember, the Ten Commandments, the actions given the Ten Commandments are fundamental to making a civilization um, blessed of God. And if we violate these Ten Commandments or we go against them, then we begin to our own demise as a nation. And we're seeing that happen at a very quick rate. And uh, we can't expect our nation to be honest and forthright and truthful if we as Bible-believing Christians aren't honest and forthright and truthful. And uh, if we're not living by the standards and the commandments that God's given to us, uh, we certainly cannot expect it of our politicians, of our uh, leaders, civil authorities, etc. As important as donkey riding might have been when the Ten Commandments were given, the Ten Commandments contain no requirements for how you should ride your donkey. It doesn't say how fast you should ride the donkey or how many people can ride on a donkey uh, because how you ride a donkey is not significant to the foundation of a society, a civilization. But these ten guidelines, qualities that give, gives us commandments that God gives us a guideline to build our lives upon are essential uh, to a civilization's blessing. If people testify falsely in a courtroom, there can be no justice. And if there's no hope of justice, then we have no civilization. 
Because your word is just as good as my word, and my word is just as good as your word. And there is no justice, because justice can only be just if it's based upon something that's just and true and right. If we don't have an absolute standard of truth, then we're really not able to be just. Uh, because it's whatever my opinion is, it's whatever my uh, you know, leanings are, whatever I'm draw, you know, drawn towards uh, that determines justice. And so a society can survive with bad donkey drivers. There's a bunch of them out there, aren't there? But it can't survive with contempt from truth. It cannot survive with uh, false witnesses. It cannot survive uh, with lies. And uh, they sort of tell us uh, politicians are known uh, for uh, being liars. Um, uh, car mechanics and uh, me me mechanics are known for what? Being liars. Car salesmen are known as being liars and uh, just by the, the default position that they're in. And so uh, as a people of God, whatever position we have, we've got to be honest. We've got to be truthful. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're not bearing false witness at any times uh, in our lives. And so when, when, you, when this happens, uh, relationships, our society... And our character, uh, when it becomes a way of life, everything is affected. I become a different person. You become a different person. Our relationships become very unstable and shaky. Everything is, is very unsure and unstable uh, when there's that uh, falseness and lying in our lives. Now, let me ask you this. Can you be trusted uh, to tell the truth? Can you be trusted to tell the truth? Can others depend upon you to tell the truth? Are you a trustworthy individual? The Bible says, a faithful man who can find. And so it mustn't be nearly as popular or easy to find someone that's faithful in being trustworthy, faithful in being truthful, faithful in being uh, above board in all areas of their life uh, because the Bible says uh, we should not bear false witness. None of us are innocent in respect to the ninth commandment. None of us are. None of us are exempt from the ninth commandment. Uh, you say, well, not me. Uh, well, no, all of us are, because the Bible says in Psalm 116.11, all men are liars. All men are liars. And so uh, we, we, we lie uh, because we're sinners. And our natural tendency is to take the path of least resistance, uh, the path of least consequences, uh, the path of least uh, um, obstacles in our life. And so by nature, we're prone to lie. And God teaches us that. None of us are innocent with respect to the ninth commandment. The Bible tells us that all men are liars. It's just not that men lie. It's just not that men lie sometimes. It's not just that men lie often. It's men are liars. And that's referencing mankind, not just men as uh, the gender, but mankind as a whole. And so all of us are liars. And that's what sin has done to us. Sin has turned us into liars. Do you understand the very first sin that was committed in the Garden of Eden was the breaking of the ninth commandment? That was the very first sin. Uh, because there as the serpent came to Eve and uh, can you eat the tree? Oh yeah, we, but we can't do this. And uh, thou shalt not surely die. Thou shalt be like God. And so Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the father of all liars, shows up in the garden. And uh, we say, well, the first sin was eating of the fruit. Now, that was the result of breaking the first sin, which was, was, was bearing that false witness, believing that false witness. And, and so Satan lied and says, you're not going to die. Satan lied and says, you're going to be like God. And uh, so the false witness was given, the lie was given, the break in the ninth command was given, and as a result of that, man fell, partook of the fruit, cast and banished out of the garden, all because of this first sin, ninth commandment, that was broken in the Garden of Eden. You see, justice is based upon truth. God is a just God. And God desires us as the people of God to be just in our dealings with each other and in our business dealings, our business transaction. He wants to be just in all areas. And so justice is based upon the justice of God. God is just. God is uh, trustworthy. God is, is uh, forthright. Uh, God's a, a straight shooter as we look at the Word of God. And so if a man lies on the witness stand, he may rob another man of his property of his time, of his reputation, or even his life. 
And it's amazing how we see this taking place even in our courts today. How uh, so much uh, of someone's reputation, someone's livelihood, someone's business, uh, someone's uh, name, someone's character, someone's life is destroyed uh, because of false witness, the bearing of false witness and uh, that we see all throughout. Uh, some years ago, a judge on the New York Supreme Court declared, here's what they said, quote, we have reached the point, this was several years ago, we have reached the point where we merely try to find out which side is lying the most. We have reached a point where we're just trying to find out which side is lying the most, uh, signifying that both sides are lying, but we want to find out who's lying the most of both lies, and then we go that route in regards to giving our verdict. Our court system, I understand it's not perfect, far from it, but it's based upon Bible principles that God gives us uh, in His Word. The legal trial forms a background of this ninth commandment in which a false witness could lead the severe punishment of a neighbor uh, that was not guilty of the crime. And so God places this commandment of all few commandments, ten commandments he has, and places it here because it says the only hope of, of a family, a structure, the only hope of a civilization, the only hope of a nation is they must understand the basis of these four things that are in relation to God, these six things that relate to one another, one of them being not making sure thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Witnesses were very important in Bible times, in Bible days. And, and the, as they are today, witnesses are still very important. But the problem is, is uh, that we're not following Bible um, guidelines in regards to how God establishes what those witnesses uh, should do or how they should behave uh, in regards to that. One of the requirements we're going to look at tonight uh, found in the Bible uh, was that in, in any prosecution of a human uh, crime that was ever committed by a human being, there must be accomplished two different things. Number one, there must be at least two or three witnesses, and those two to three witnesses must, must together um, testify of the wrong that was done, and they must be in complete harmony with each other for there to even be the process to move forward in regards to any accusation uh, moving forward to see if there was any um, crime or, or problem that was committed as a result. If there was only one witness, then it's essentially one man's word against another. And in those cases, there's practically really no way to find justice uh, because your word is, is just as good as someone else's word and it's one person's opinion versus another person's opinion, one perspective versus another perspective, and there is no true basis to be able to, to, be able to find that basis of, of, uh, of guilt and, and uh, innocence as a result of that. Now, that's where God comes in, and God says, Vengeance is mine, I'll repay, saith the Lord. And so nobody ever gets by with anything. And he said, boy, nobody, uh, I got no more than, uh, you know, there's only one witness, or there's only this or that. And uh, God says, you're going to get caught. Behold, your sin will, it will find us out. And, and so just because uh, you may not have the two or three witnesses as God establishes for us, uh, we do need to understand that God sees all. He knows all. He watches all. And uh, he's not blindsided by anything. Uh, we may hide it from our boss. We may hide it from our spouse. We may hide it from our parents. We may hide it from each other, but we cannot hide. Everything the Bible says is open uh, in the eyes and sight of God. In fact, the death penalty could only be enforced by the testimony, again, of two or three witnesses, for one witness was not sufficient against a person committing a crime. Now, let's look at several verses tonight. As we look at this thought, thou shalt not bear false witness, all right, looking against thy name. Let's take our Bibles, let's go to Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35, and uh, let's look in verse number 30. This is something that will really help all of us in regards to our relationships, our interactions uh, with each other, and it certainly will be able to uh, avoid a lot of hurts, disappointments, and injustices that may uh, be avoided uh, because we follow God's uh, guidelines or parameters concerning uh, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You got it, Numbers chapter 35 and verse number 30. 
Bible says, Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. Notice the plurality there. And God is for the death penalty. Uh, you take a life, a life is to be taken. As a result of that, capital punishment is a God-ordained, uh, a God-sanctioned, God-approved uh, position. And uh, we would not have the overcrowding of our prisons. Uh, we wouldn't have the repeat offenders like we do if we follow through with the guidelines in regards to judicial sin. That's a whole different uh, series of messages we could teach on that God talks about. Uh, but because we don't give the, the equal punishment for equal crimes committed, uh, we don't then enforce uh, justice the way God desires. So God says, Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. Plural there. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. And so if there's only one witness that says they did wrong or they committed this crime or they killed somebody uh, because it was someone's life, uh, one witness couldn't say, but I saw him do it. And I was there. I was an eyewitness of that. Uh, if it was only one witness, God said, you can't put someone to death because of one witness. You know why? Uh, there's a lot of folks uh, that could uh, falsely accuse any of us at any given time to put us to death, not physical death, uh, but could cause a lot of death uh, to a lot of things, dreams and, and goals, ambitions, and, and uh, our name and all those type of things. So God tells us that capital punishment is his Bible, uh, and, uh, and uh, it needs to be followed through with the mouth of witnesses. And again, uh, it's interesting here that uh, uh, as we look at the witnesses that God talks about in the Word of God, it's the mouth of witnesses, and it's those witnesses gathered together in the same room, and they must all agree uh, together concerning the crime that was seen. No such thing as an anonymous uh, witness. And uh, that's become real big uh, the last several years. Uh, we got this anonymous uh, witness, uh, this anonymous report, this anonymous this. That's, uh, anyone can throw up an anonymous whatever. And uh, if someone uh, isn't able to come and do what the Bible says, where it says the mouth, the mouth of witnesses, is that something that you write down? It's the mouth of the witnesses that you share together in agreement because we're talking about someone's life in this example here. We're talking about death. The capital punishment. We're, talk, we're talking about the death penalty. And as a result of, uh, of this here, uh, as a result of, of the crime that was committed. Let me give you another verse here. Go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 17 and verse number 6. God teaches us, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And uh, God holds this to a very high standard. He places it in the Ten Commandments. It is an abomination to God. And uh, we see many, many details outlined in force in Scripture that tells us uh, the value or significance of it. Look in Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. And so again, we see the emphasis there of what? The mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses. Uh, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death? Uh, meaning what? Uh, you've got to be uh, proven guilty. You are innocent until proven guilty. Now, I understand that our, our system has made a, a switch, and nowadays it's your guilty until proven innocent. But that's not Bible, and that's not how our country was founded. It was your innocent until uh, proven guilty. And uh, if you can't have enough witnesses and enough facts, then guess what? The person walks free. And uh, you say, but that's just not fair. That's not just. No, that's what justice is because sometimes uh, those that commit a crime may walk free, but God is the ultimate judge. And we never want to put anyone that's innocent as being guilty, it's better to let those that are guilty to go free if we're not to be just than to let someone who's innocent to pay a punishment that they don't owe. They don't. And that's a principle that God's teaching us here about the two or three witnesses uh, in, uh, in unison together, in the same room together. And, uh, shall, and he says he's worthy to be put to death. And so in other words, if you accuse someone of sin, you must have the evidence of two or three witnesses in order to confirm it. And then you must have the facts to back up the, uh, the witnesses that come on the scene. Jesus had false accusers that showed up. There were two or three witnesses that showed up as false accusers, but they didn't have the facts to back up their witness. 
And so it's not just you surround, you know, uh, uh, several people saying, hey, let's say this and let's do this and let's, let's confide here and let's go and, and ruin this person and let's, let's cause the death penalty to come. No, you have, have to have the, the unison of the witness, yes, and uh, uh, the story had to uh, uh, be in unison together, but also the facts had to be presented uh, because, again, we're talking about the life of someone. And, and God ultimately wants, uh, wants to avoid anyone innocent ever being declared guilty who's not guilty. And even if it means at times that it seems like someone's getting away with something, no one ever gets away with anything. You will. We, we will reap what we sow. And uh, no one gets by. Uh, it may have been a week. It may have been a month. It may be, have been a year or so. But behold, the Bible says, our sin will find us out. And so uh, we see the value of this. So God was concerned about truthfulness, that the punishment imposed on a witness who gave false testimony, perjury, was the same as the punishment that would have been given to the one that was on trial. Let me give you the verse here. By the way, this would eliminate a lot of these false testimonies of witnesses is if they're found to be in perjury, lying and false as a witness, that whatever the punishment would have been for the one that they're testifying against, witnessing against, that they're found out to be innocent and they falsely accuse them, then the, me as a false accuser, I would then pay the penalty that they were owed. That's Bible. And don't you think if we get back to the Bible, and that's how our judicial system was founded, and that's how it was run for so many years, and the crime was a deterrent, or you know, the punishment of crime was a deterrent. Take your Bibles, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. And that's one of the, great, the biggest frustrations that our law enforcement has, and God bless uh, our faithful men and women on the, our law enforcement, they're on the front lines to, to protect us and uh, uh, ensure the, the liberties and freedoms that we have. But there's frustration uh, because uh, they, they risk their lives uh, to arrest folks, and within days or hours, they're out on the streets again, committing the same crimes over and over and over again. And, and so uh, we need to understand the importance of getting back to the Bible. You got it there? Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Look with me beginning in verse number 15. Now we're talking about how, how concerned God is about truthfulness. Look at verse 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinned. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a mouthful right there. It doesn't matter. God's saying in general, in, in uh, essence here, whatever someone does, no matter what it is, if there's only one witness of that, then there's no, there's no pursuing at all. There's no, there's no leg to stand on. There's no basis to move forward at all uh, in, uh, in this thought. So he said, one witness shall not rise against a man for any iniquity, for any sin, or any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of Three witnesses shall the matter be established. And so that doesn't mean that the person's guilty, but it does mean now we have a basis to now we can begin to try this individual to see if the, the, the witnesses are in agreement with each other, to see if the witnesses and the facts they bring to the, to the table are, are uh, enough to be able to condemn someone innocent to proven guilty. If not, then we don't, we don't pr uh, proceed with guilt, uh, but we'll, we'll begin the process. Uh, we'll begin the, uh, the inquiry, if you would. We've got the established ingredients that are necessary to begin that investigation. If these are not uh, uh, there, if they're not relevant, uh, if they're not there and present, then there's no basis for a case even to be investigated, uh, much less or ever to be guilt uh, decided concerning the individual. Verse 16, if a false witness... Rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong. So he's, he's saying lies, uh, bearing false witness. Then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priest and the judges which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make, make a diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother. So here's what they did. Uh, so a false witness has been seen that someone was saying something that was not true. And so they take both of the men, the one that gave false witness and the one that was 
being uh, testified against, the, the proposed criminal, that one that they want to be guilty, both of those are set aside and in the same room uh, before a judge, a priest, and, and the leader of the authorities there, they then both are in that room for then uh, the story or the, or the facts to be given ex- accordingly. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. What's that mean, diligent inquisition? That's very important because they're doing some fact searching. Uh, they're following through with uh, uh, references and uh, checking on all the different things that are being said. Were they truly there? Was it something that was done? And they're doing diligent inquisition. They're not assuming, they're not presuming, they're not taking someone's word for it. They're doing diligent inquisition. Why? Because this person's life, uh, they're innocent. They're, they may be guilty, but we've got to make sure it's just. And behold, if a witness be a false witness, and it says, Fight false against his brother, then shall he do unto him, notice verse 19, then shall ye do unto him, who's the him? The false witness, as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from him. Now, among you, now wasn't that what was done with Haman? Remember uh, in uh, Esther there? And uh, boy, he wanted to get rid of more, you know, the whole story there. And uh, what happened? The very gallows, the, the, the ones that he had built, to hang the, 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 uh, uh, the, the people, his enemies on, uh, when the truth came out and the king found out that uh, this man was, was, was setting up uh, and, uh, and was falsely testifying, then Haman was the one that the very things he built to, to kill someone else, to hang someone else, were the very gallows that he was hung on. Uh, by the way, that's Bible. That wasn't, un, that wasn't unkind. That wasn't unloving. Uh, that wasn't uh, in, uh, unsympathetic, uncompassionate. That was the way God says we've got to deal with this. Because if we don't deal with false, thou shalt not bear false witness. If we don't deal with false witnesses, then it's just going to become rampant. If there's no consequences for telling a lie, if there's no consequences for uh, being uh, untruthful, if there's no consequences, then, then what's the motive to not do it again? And to continue and, and to be honest. Or what's the deterrent? So others continue to be honest. And they look at others and say, well, they got by with being dishonest. There was just a slap on the hand. They got by with a bearing false witness. And there was no problem that came there when no justice was served. Now, not only does this continue allowing the false witness to move forward and being false uh, continuing, but also allows those that maybe were on the borderline saying, well, they didn't have any problems, no, no arrest, uh, no, no concerns, no co- punishment, no, no problems came their way. And so now we're more vulnerable Human flesh, because what? All men are liars. All men are liars. And uh, if we can find uh, ways that we can lie and not have consequences for our lying, then we're going to do it. And uh, that's human nature. And, and so uh, God says here, so if a person is caught or found out that he's a false witness, whatever the punishment was for, the, for that one will become his. Verse 20. And those that remain. Notice now, here's the key. And those, this is why justice is so important. Those which remain, those that watch, those that observe, those that hear and fear shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eyes shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. God said, don't let your heart of love and compassion and oh, poor fella, and they're having such a hard time. He says, no, sir, uh uh-uh. If a wrong was done and and a false witness has lied about someone, then whatever that that punishment was to be, that will be now their punishment. And uh, why is that important? So everyone else will learn and hear and fear. I said, wow. If, they, if that was a punishment for stuffing a ballot box, boy, I'm certainly not going to be tempted to stuff a ballot box. If that was done for saying something false, then boy, I'm sure not going to do that. I'm not going to step in and ever try to do that. Why? There's a punishment. And that punishment's a deterrent to ever doing something that might be drawing us in a weak, vulnerable moment for us to yield the temptation. And, uh, but we don't see the punishments uh, at work in our jobs, embezzlement, whatever it might be. Uh, We don't see the consequences that come as a result. And so God says, God's very concerned about truthfulness, so much so that if anyone uh, commits perjury or gives false testimony, God says their punishment, it now becomes your punishment. And I imagine folks would be a lot less likely to give testimony uh, if they knew that their testimony might be uh, checked and as the Bible talks about here, uh, diligently uh, searched out, 
was the word that was used here. Uh, it was uh, where it just diligent inquisition. If there was a diligent inquisition of what you said or what I said, I may be a lot more careful of what I say or what I don't say. Uh, and uh, God says this is so important. So in the case of crime that would be punishable by death, the false witness would then be put to death. So if there's someone on, on death row and it comes to find out, false witness, you lied. This person, uh, you, 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 you put him in a position that was not right, was not true. Now you as a false witness, you now will go to the lecture chair. You'll go to the gallows. You'll be the one uh, that pays the price as a result. And again, like I said a moment ago, no such thing as anonymous sources. Justice is not served with anonymous sources. It may lead in a direction to where you'll go and begin to, to gather together witnesses and facts, but justice cannot be served because you've got all these anonymous witnesses coming forward. Anyone can say they have an anonymous witness. And if someone's not willing to, with their mouth, along with other witnesses, come in the same room with the confirmed facts and tell us with the, the understanding that if you're proven to be false, that the crime punishment that was going to be given to that person, I'll now have to bear that punishment. I think we'd weed out a lot of witnesses. I think we'd weed out a lot of people uh, that are bribed and paid uh, to say things or, or to uh, act or not say things as a result. So every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. The natural tendency for us is to hear one side of the story in a case and to immediately decide in the favor of the one that we've heard. That's our natural tendency by default uh, to go in that area. It sounds convincing. Our sympathies go out to the person. Then later we learn it was only one side of the story. And we were unjust because we only heard one witness. We only heard one side of the story. And God said, you don't even give, give time of day uh, if it's only a witness, a time of story, you've got to make sure you do diligent inquisition. Diligent inquisition is the terminology that God uses in his word. And so uh, it may sound convincing, it may be sympathetic, our sympathies go out to them, but when we hear the other side of the story, we realize maybe the first person distorted the facts, or at least maybe colored them in their favor. That certainly is a tendency, because why? We're all liars. All men are liars. And uh, we need to be very careful in jumping to conclusions in regards to a witness. Why? I heard it. I read it. I, I, I know that person. They're a credible person. No, it, it has nothing to do with someone being credible or not credible. It's God's standard that says if it's one person, one witness, then it's not a groundwork. It's not a foundation that we can build anything upon. It's not fair to the person that's being accused uh, to put them against one other person or vice versa as a result. Let me give you a verse here. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 17. And again, a lot of these principles are outlined for us uh, in Scripture. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 17. Of course, Proverbs have so many wonderful nuggets of truth uh, that, uh, that we can glean upon. And so the tendency for each of us is hear one side of the story, a person's side of the story, and immediately decide in that person's favor. Uh, but notice what it says in Proverbs 18, verse 17. Proverbs 18, verse 17. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. Notice now, he that is first in his own cause seemeth just. Whoever can get to you and I first and tell you the story first is usually the story we believe. And in that person's eyes, the Bible says, he that's first in his own cause seemeth just. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, that sounds right. And uh, so a wife uh, reaches out, uh, uh, your wife reaches out to her friends or whatever else, and she's the first to share her cause uh, of complaint concerning you as a husband. And she begins to say this about you and this about you and this about you. And uh, those uh, friends uh, of your wife are, are very compassionate and sympathetic, and uh, it seems just, it seems right, uh, you know the person, uh, you're sure they're genuine in what they're saying, and because they're the first to come and tell you, uh, and uh, it seems uh, so real and so right, you're prone to follow through and believe what you've just heard. 
from that person. But the Bible says in the last of the verse, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. And so the diligent inquisition must be done. And uh, if you're not willing to do the diligent inquisition, then, uh, then there's no need to even listen to the witness as a result of that. Because God says if you're going to uh, search him out and do the, make sure that what is being said uh, is accurate and truthful. And uh, you see, when you make a decision before you try to say, uh, ascertain the full facts, we, ask, we, we, uh, we become less uh, than just uh, in our judicial system and place ourselves under the censor of Proverbs 18, 13. Look in Proverbs 18, verse number 13. When we make a decision before trying to ascertain all the full facts. Proverbs 18, 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it is folly. It is folly and shame unto him. So someone comes to you, tells you something. They're first to come to you with their cause. It seems just. They seem sincere. Uh, they seem genuine. It seems real. Your heart goes out to them. The story is, is so uh, uh, passionate that you believe them. And you come to a decision very quickly, immediately. Well, the Bible says here, you answer a matter before you hear it. Uh, and you say, I, I believe you. And uh, I, I agree with you. That's not right. And that God says, that person that comes and answer quickly without diligent inquisition, without searching out the matter, God says it's shame and it's folly for that person that doesn't do that. Uh, you're, listen, you're putting your reputation on the line when you go after someone else's reputation. When you falsely accuse someone else, you're putting your character on the line. So you better make sure you get all the facts right. Because if it comes to find out that what you propagated or what was said as a bearing false witness was not true or at least it was slanted because you have no idea what the other side of the story is then you put yourself your reputation on very unstable shaky ground uh, very uncredible ground God says uh, it's folly it's shame unto him there's an example given let's go to 2nd Samuel and I'll give you an example of how this is is seen out in scripture concerning a David and Mephibosheth. 2 Samuel chapter 16. We see an example of how this played out uh, where uh, someone came with the first cause, the first story, and David just heard one side of the story. He quickly came to a conclusion because the story was so sincere. It sounded so real. It, it sounded, uh, and sometimes we so much want there to be something wrong with someone. If someone mentions something wrong about them, we always say, oh, I knew there was something wrong. So we jump to that conclusion. And so we see the example here in 2 Samuel chapter number um, uh, 16, look with me, beginning in verse, let me read the, the verses for us, and then I'll sort of highlight as we read. Verse 1, 2 Samuel chapter 16. And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Meshibapheth, met him. All right, something's going to happen here. All right, so he's on the top, about to the top of the hill. Someone meets him first. Whoever's first with their cause is just. And whoever tells you their story first, you believe it. So Z Zibud shows up first. He's on the, just about the top of the hill. And the servant of Mephibosheth shows up. Someone that should have been supportive of Mephibosheth. Someone that should have been an ally or a friend of Mephibosheth. So the, 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 the Zibud, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled. And upon them 200 loaves of bread and 100 uh, bunches of raisins and a hundred of summer fruits and a bottle of wine and the king sounds like bribery to me she's showing up with a donkey's full of a lot of goods and stuff material materialistic you know stuff and uh, when the and the king said unto Ziba what meanest thou by these I mean he was amazed and so David was a little past the top of the hill Ziba shows up with these uh, uh, donkeys and, and uh, they're, they're, they're saddled with all this uh, stuff. And he says, what is this, Ziba? What meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, the asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. And the king said, verse 3, and where is thy master's son? And Ziba said to the king, 
Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem, for he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. Then said the king to Ziba, Behold, thine are all that pertain unto Mephibosheth. And Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. Boy, what a, what a wonderful Christian response, wasn't it? What did she say? I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. Here's what happened. David's on his way home. He's just gotten over the hill. Ziba, this servant of Mephibosheth, shows up with these donkeys, piled with all kinds of stuff. He said, what's all this for? Oh, I, I got this for you. Uh, I got this for you. Well, why do I need all this stuff? What do you mean? I'm not going on a journey. I'm coming home. Oh, you can't come home. Because Mephibosheth said today, he's taken over the kingdom of his father. He's taken over the throne. You have no throne to go back to. You have no palace to return to. You have no kingdom to take. And David, because it was the first story heard, it seemed so genuine, she seemed so sincere, he immediately came to a decision, a rash decision. He didn't do diligent inquisition. He didn't follow through to make sure what she was saying was true and accurate. And so what David said, all that belongs to Mephibosheth, it's yours, Ziba. If that's what Mephibosheth's doing, if he's going to uh, take the kingdom away from me, if he's going to take over the throne, then Ziba, all that was his, I'm giving it to you because you were honest. You came and you're looking out for me. You've brought all this stuff for me. I am so indebted to you. I owe it to you. It's yours. And Ziba humbled herself and said, O oh, king, may I find grace in your sight, O oh, Lord, my king. What a spiritual response. But later, Mephibosheth has a chance to tell his side of the story. David then realized that he had made a decision without having sufficient evidence. He blew it. He blew it. The same way we blow it. Because we heard something because someone was first to tell us a story. Someone was first to show up and say, listen to this, and this is for your good, and let me help you out, and, and uh, let me help you uh, head off the pass and avoid this problem. What, what do I need all this for? Oh, yeah, didn't you hear? Haven't you heard Mephibosheth? David, he's going to take over the kingdom. He is. Oh, Ziba, he's not going to get the kingdom because I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. Later he found out that he heard the first in his own cause. It seemed just. He that answers a matter before he heareth it. What's that mean? You better search diligently and make sure you hear both sides before you put anything in print, before you put anything uh, out there as though it's truth and facts. Why? Because your reputation's on the line. And how you handle this situation may determine your success or failure, your future or your decline as a result. You know, this is a powerful verse. I want you to go there with me, if you would, in the Gospel of John. As we talk about witnesses, the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Jesus Christ recognized and uh, followed through with this principle of uh, justice and not being a false witness and making sure, bearing false witness, and making sure there were ample witnesses that were um, a part of, uh, of his life as well. Notice in John 5, 31. John chapter 5, verse number 31. <clears throat> the Bible said, Jesus speaking here, he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. What? Jesus said, if I'm the only witness that's witnessing of what I'm saying, then what I'm witnessing is not true. You're, you're God in the flesh. If you say it, we believe you. We don't need two or three witnesses. No, he established the law, and he, well, he didn't come to break the law. He came to what? Fulfill the law. And so here's Jesus, and he said, listen, don't believe me because I tell you. He says, there needs to be witnesses to confirm that what I tell you 
is truly truthful and true. So he says in John chapter 5, verse 31, he says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So what's Jesus doing in the next several verses? We'll look at him. Jesus presents four witnesses to testify of the truth of his witness of himself. Because he says, I'm here to fulfill the law. Let's look at those witnesses. Let's look in John chapter 5. Let's, let's go to, um, let's look in verse number 32. I, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say that you might be saved. He that was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his life. Now notice how the first witness is who? Uh, verse 33, you sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. So God says, if I'm the only witness, Jesus says, don't believe me. My witness isn't valid. But I'm going to give you four witnesses that collaborate my witness so you'll know it's true. Number one, John the Baptist is a witness one, number one. Let's read on. Let's go to the next one. Go to verse number 36. He said, but I have a greater witness than that of John. So John the Baptist is a witness of the truth, but I've got a greater witness than John the Baptist. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So Jesus, four testimonies, a witness. Number one, John the Baptist is a witness. Number two witness, the works that I've done. No man has done works that I've done. You see, the miracles that Jesus did confirmed who he was. And so he says, what's a witness? Don't believe me because I say believe me because the scripture says that two to three witnesses allows us to be able to come together to see if what's being said is true. And Jesus, who's God in the flesh, if he gives us four witnesses, then who are we to say, well, I believe them because they're my family member. Or they're this, or I trust them. Listen, if we could trust Jesus, we could trust him. But he says, don't trust me. Jesus says that. He says right here, he said, listen, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. But it is true because I got four witnesses. Number one, John the Baptist. Number two, greater than John the Baptist's witness is uh, my works. Look at the next one, verse 37. And the Father himself, which has sent me, hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape, and yet ye have known his, his word uh, abiding in you for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. So witness number three is what? The Father himself. So witness number one, God says, is John the Baptist. Jesus says, John the Baptist. Witness number two, the works I've done. Witness number three, the Father himself. Oh, but there's a fourth witness. Look down, if you would, in verse number 39 and verse 40. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify or witness of me. And you will not come to me. You might have life. What's the fourth witness? Scripture, the word of God. And so if Jesus, so when someone comes, they say, well, you just got to trust me. Well, where, where's the witnesses to even collaborate, corroborate that, that we need to even follow through to see if it's even worth searching out or if there's any reason to, to investigate. Jesus himself said, if I'm the only witness, then don't believe my witness. He said, but I'm not the only witness. I've got John the Baptist, right, number one. I've got John the Baptist as my witness. I've got uh, the, uh, the Spirit, I've got uh, the, the Father as my witness. I've got uh, my works as a witness, and I've got the Word of God, Scripture, as my witness. And because I have, where there's two or three, where did it ever say you have to have four witnesses? He says, I'm not challenged by not having a lack of witnesses. You want witnesses? God says, I've given you my word, and the word, every verse in this Bible, testifies and witnesses that who I say I am, I am. And it's a witness of a testimony to God. And so if by failing to obtain the competent testimony of two or three witnesses, we can cause broken hearts, ruined reputations, divided churches, Severed friendships. Well, if we follow God's word, you'll avoid a lot of human hurt and a lot of injustices. A lot of injustices. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. God established justice and fairness 
through the standard of two or three witnesses. We must have testimonial evidence of a wrong and it must confirm or be confirmed through the facts. This is a biblical way to ensure justice and fairness. If there's not those multiple witnesses in the same room in agreement with each other and brought in the same room with the one they're accusing so truth can be diligently inquired and if someone's not willing to put themselves in that position then why in the world are we believing that which is a false witness because it doesn't meet the standard that God says ought to be met so we see the potential of causing great injustice to an innocent party thus the ten commandment or the ninth commandment I'm sorry the ninth commandment conveys this very important thing not just in a court of law but in all areas of life, all areas of life. I'm talking about employees at a job. Uh, I'm talking about relationships in a family, friendships, churches. I'm talking about all types of relationships. And that God says, it can't just be one. Listen, all of us have enemies. All of us have people against us who could say anything that they like to say. And if they're the first to bring the cause to us, it sounds so sincere, it sounds so just. They're good people. They have no reason to be vindictive. There's nothing that I know of that uh, would cause them to want to talk like that or say those type of things. But wait a minute. Uh, are we making sure that we're doing the diligent inquisition as a result? God loves the truth. God delights in the truth. God upholds the truth because God is a God of truth. God established truth and has revealed truth to us in his word. God is light, 1 John 1, 5, and in him is no darkness at all. What's light signify? Truth, integrity, righteousness, honesty. God is light. And that men love darkness because their deeds were evil. But God shows up with the light. Listen, truth is light. Truth is light. Listen, light shines in the darkness of crevices of places. There's no need to fear the holding of truth. There's no need to fear the standing of truth. And so not only is God the true and living God, uh, but he wants all of us uh, to be a people that walk uh, in truth, that delight in truth, that love truth, that speak the truth. Uh, you say, but preacher, what about white lies? What about white lies? You know, those are things that we say so we don't hurt someone's feelings, you know. Uh, those are things that, uh, that, you know, it's just sort of acceptable to where uh, we might just imply something, but we don't want to give all the information because it would be very offensive and that wouldn't be something that we want uh, to do at all. The Bible says that we should speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. Speak the truth in love. What's that mean? White lies are never right, but kindness, tact, courtesy, is always the acceptable thing. That's speaking the truth in love. A white lie is never justifiable. Uh, it's never condoned in scripture. It's never allowed as being acceptable. Uh, you're to speak the truth in love. Let's be courteous, let's be kind, let's be tactful, but let's not justify our compassion uh, and our, our concern for someone in, uh, in not speaking the truth in love and speaking as the Bible, as we talk about, as white lies. Let me give you this last verse, and there are two more verses, and we're done. Go to Psalm 51 and verse number 6. Psalm 51 and verse number 6. Behold, this is what God desires. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Psalm 51, 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. This is David's prayer of confession. I've done wrong. I've sinned. God, through David, says, God, you desire truth in the inward parts, in the hidden part that shall make me to know wisdom. If God desires truth in the inward parts, then white lies, regardless of our intentions, fail to meet the standard that God establishes. God says, I want truth in the inward parts. I want it so much a part of you that it's just, it's just who you are. And again, you don't have to be uh, obnoxious. You don't have to be unkind or rude. But you do need to speak the truth. And you need to speak it in love. 
And that you need to speak it because the truth is what sets people free. It's what allows them to find liberation. Satan attempts to destroy God's truth. The world seeks to undermine God's truth. But God's truth will always abide. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word, God's truth, it will always be in existence. And so tonight, as you look at the, the question of thou, the command they're given, thou shalt not bear false witness. That's a powerful command. It's the first sin that was committed in the Garden of Eden, breaking the ninth commandment, lying, lying. If you want God, if we want God to bless our business, we've got to be honest. If we want God to bless our finances, we've got to be honest and tithe. We want God to bless our lives. We've got to be honest in our dealings with one another. You want God to bless your marriage? You've got to be honest. You've got to be honest in the relationship of husband and wife. You've got to be honest in our dealings with each other. You want God's goodness and hand of blessings on our life. We've got to be a people that says, I don't want to break that command of bearing false witness against my neighbor. I don't want to put myself, my reputation, the blessings of God, uh, that, that are the, my, my life, I don't want to put my life in a position to where I may lose that because I hear a witness. It's the first story I've heard. It sounds so sincere. It sounds so just. It sounds so believable. But I've not done diligent inquisition. And if you've not done diligent inquisition, so how diligent is, is the inquisition have to be? You need to talk to the person that's being accused wrongfully or rightfully. But you'll never know until confrontation is made as a result of that. And for you not to give the other person the benefit of the doubt is unjust on our part, just as it's unjust on the court system's part to cause an innocent person to be sentenced to prison because they're guilty until proven innocent. No, there's going to be some guilty people that are set free because there wasn't enough witness and testimony and evidence to prove their guilt. But they will be caught. They will be caught. And it's not my job to be the judge, jury, and verdict. That's up to God. And so I want to make sure that whatever I say or whatever I portray in, in my life, uh, whatever I, I blog or whatever I write is always done with diligent inquisition. And if I don't know, then I don't post. If I'm not sure, I'm not going to make a statement. And if something is addressed to me and is said, have you heard about this? This is always my first response. Well, I hope it's not true. I hope it's not true. But if it is, I'm sure that God's justice will be served. I hope it's not true. I leave it at that. I don't make a decision one way or the other because... It's not within my jurisdiction to make a decision. Number two, it's not within my realm of information gathering to be able to make a decision. So it's not fair or just or right. It's not biblical to be able to make that stand because it's not based upon the guidelines that God gives for us to be just to each other. I hope you're innocent. I hope what's being said is not true. I hope it's not right. It may come out that it is, but it's not because I convicted you of that. I would be very surprised to find out that it is true. And if we would live our lives that way, thou shalt not bear false witness. It would help us. It would help build the structure and the foundation of a civilization of our church, of our family, of our relationships. Every area of our life is so important. Let's be a people that are trustworthy. Let's be a people that can be trusted. Thank you, Father, for tonight.